Stephen Porges is a global scientific celebrity and I consider it a great achievement that he find the time to talk in my podcast. Dr. Porges is a neuroscientist who studies trauma and he is focused as well on how past experiences, especially difficult ones, affect our actions in the present. His polyvagal theory interprets in an amazing way the connection between our brain and our body, our individual organs, and how our unprocessed traumas can affect that connection. Listen to a remarkable interview about the theory that explains some of the patterns of our behavior. Listen to our conversation about how the body and brain can be connected and how this affects our lives. It's a special day for me, a special celebration for me that I have the honor to make an interview with Stefan Porges on the other side of the internet line. Uh, good day for you, Mr. Porges. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Dietra. Thank you. Uh, on 22nd of April, you will have an uh, internet uh, meeting with a Czech audience. Ah. And I, I start just to open the gate maybe for anybody who would need some more courage to start to talk this, <laughs> ask you maybe, and maybe just uh, try to uh, target your polyvagal theory and just think mm. about about it all. Um, uh, can you remember uh, how long time is it when you felt yourself scared or being real afraid of anything? Oh, okay. I, that's a trick question because if you understand the polyvagal theory, uh, it's the label you're giving to your bodily reaction. So you, of course, we react to uncertainty and uh, often threat with a physiological response. The question is, what do we make of it? And that's really where polyvagal theory says, yes, my body reacted, but how do I interpret it? And a lot of people's bodies move into this state like this, and then they interpret it to justify why they are like that. It's maybe because of what you just said to me. So, but personally, um, I realized, because I really live in this world of uh, mental health disorders, clinical uh, clinical medicine, psychiatry. I am a neuroscience by training and by practice. And I actually taught a course with a colleague about 15 years ago. It was on social anxiety. And I actually didn't actually know what it was because I didn't really experience it. So I've learned, what I like to often say is I've learned so much of what it is to be a human from individuals who have experienced adversity because what they have done. So when you get to the concept of scared, scared as a reaction is a normal bodily response, but a chronic retuning of that system to be in a constant state of threat or constant state of anxiety is not healthy. And that, so the issue is we have to separate acute reactions from being locked into chronic states. Thank you very much for this. I think if we can start just to define the field where we will mm -hmm. just keep ourselves. Uh, okay. So we will talk about trauma, about deeper mental state. What What is it, trauma? Um, well, this is a really, you know, the question which sounds simple is actually a question that leads to conflict in 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 the in the field what has happened is that trauma is being defined as events and i don't accept that i feel that some people literally can walk through fire and some people a glance where you look away from them and their bodies will go into those states of threat so it means that trauma is really defined by the individual's response it's not necessarily bad to think of events like being in warfare or having all kinds of challenges. But remember, individual differences. We are all a little bit individual, and at times we're more resilient than other times. So the real question is, did I respond, and how was, my, was I able to, in a sense, dissipate that reaction? So if my threat remains locked and I'm in this constant state of defense, then that trauma, that traumatic event, has retuned my nervous system. And if it's chronically retuned, then I have major problems. Uh, can we try uh, more concretize it by the opposite way? What does it yeah. mean to feel safe? And ah, okay. So that's even a more interesting question because a lot of people don't know what it means. So let's create an operational definition of what fe feeling safe may mean, at least from my perspective. Feeling safe is really dependent upon a physiological state 
that is supporting our homeostatic processes. That means health, growth, and restoration. And once that system gets disrupted, our psychological experiences that sit on top of that physiology are really uh, experiences of anxiety and vulnerability. So we feel safe as really a projection of our body doing what it's supposed to do. And we can even reverse it because when you don't feel safe and you take your heart rate or you sweat or your you know, your body isn't prepared for defense. But when we feel safe, there's something almost magical that occurs. Our physiology starts doing what it evolved to do, support our health, growth, and restoration. But more than that, when we're safe, we have the opportunities to be spontaneously engaging with others. So we are now more benevolent more compassionate, and in polyvagal terms, we have the capacity to co-regulate, help other people calm down, as well as ourselves. So there is other very important point, and this is connection between my psychic part of my life and my existential and the physical part of my yeah. existential. And the point where these two sides are just yeah. touching or in dialogue, it's one kind of response of in which state I am. Is it right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what you're describing is really the, a brain-body co-regulation. And what happens is that when people live in literally the world we're in, they start to not listen to what their body is telling them. They're no longer feeling their body. Their body's no longer influencing how they think. And over time, the neural pathways that are connecting the brain and the body lose their control. And then we start developing disorders, illnesses, physical, physical disorders, and mental health disorders. So what I'm really saying is, actually, I'm giving different words to what you said, that there is a co-regulation between the brain and the body, and they're talking to each other. And when we're under threat, they stop talking. Uh, should I think about myself that if I'm sometimes surprised by myself that I start to have troubles just with breathing or uh, I have bad feelings about my stomach in uh, yeah. if a special person is in my company and uh, ah. that maybe I have some problem that no, I it's not the, we no we're going to throw out the word problem we're just going to say your body reacted isn't that interesting you know we we replace problem with curiosity. And we replace the problem by saying, look, my nervous system is so competent, so astute, it detects certain features in the other that I wasn't even aware of. And what it can be is the person's voice may not be welcoming. The person may turn away from you. The person may look at their watch or what do people do now? They look at their phone and suddenly your body feels, oops, your body feels uh like it's under threat. And that's, in polyvagal terms, that's a neuroception. The nervous system detected a signal of threat. You didn't know it was threat. The nervous system did it. It's not in the level of awareness. And we're seduced by thinking that we are really a intelligent species, meaning that we can really uh, control our bodies. And in reality, so much of our bodily responses are more reflexes. So what you're really describing is you had a biological or body reflex. Is there something wrong with you? No, you your body evolved to do that. Now, something can develop if you stay locked into that because it's not healthy for you. So this is very important. Please correct me if I'm not right. Uh, uh, we all know the strange feelings in some special situations. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's just a spontaneous, a normal reaction to the real concept of the situation, it's all right. But if I'm locked in some feeling yeah. from my history, from behind, I would say. Yeah. Well, let me kind of elaborate a little bit on that. And let's go back to your first statement, which was we all know. Well, what I'm going to tell you is we don't all know. A lot of people who experience severe adversity in their childhood and in their work life and their marriage life, social life, their bodies are so locked into threat that they stop feeling their bodies. So if you ask them what it felt like to feel safe and relaxed, you might get just a blank stare. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so we know that people have different feelings and we know there's a progression. Now, the other important point you said was really the associations with these bodily feelings. 
So let's, you know, a lot of individuals come from homes that are not really, I would say, supportive, loving, and accessible. They'd be more, we would call it abusive. And we've also, you know, as we mature, we know that there have been different cultural shifts because at one point it was culturally accepted that the family, especially the father, should be very strict and create the boundaries and use uh, punishments to make sure behaviors were learned. And often what happens is that the nervous system associates like a male voice, a lower pitch of a voice with the being 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 uh, uh, disciplined. So the feelings get associated. And so the part that we're dealing with is not the trigger of the threat, but that the trigger gives a physiological response of which we have no choice about. Mm -hmm. But our feelings of that physiological response, which is called interoception, we are feeling what's going on in our body, that we interpret. And that we can often associate with different settings, like for many people, and, and this has always been a surprise to me, that many of my colleagues get very anxious in giving talks. And then I would say, well, why give talks then? You know, because for me, giving a talk is an opportunity for a social interaction, which is uh, comforting, rewarding, and makes me feel good. All right. And... As I read information about your uh, scientific career, probably all your life you are trying to help the people who are just locked in these previous situations. Yeah, uh, I think, and maybe I'm totally mistaken, that there are one, there is one group of people who can recognize that they are locked in their trauma. There's some situation uh, that happened to them because they faced really severe situations, mm -hmm. really bad situations. But there might be another group of people who can't remember that because they almost uh -huh. erase it. Yeah, well, what you bring up is something that I keep learning or relearning because it's so hard to accept the fact that someone doesn't remember their experiences, especially when they're adversive. But we start to realize that the nervous system is really a very powerful mechanism. It enables us literally to not remember at times, to dissociate, to give up those feelings, but at a price. So when we give up feelings and we give up memories of them, we are turning off the natural healing properties of our body, of regulating the brain and the, and the body are talking to each other, One is enabling, the brain is sending signals to the organs that enable the organs to heal. And then the organs are sending signals to the brain saying, everything's fine. Now you can use those higher brain structures. But for many people, the feedback from the body is that you're in a chronic state of threat. And now the cortex, the higher brain structures are into this, taking care of myself. And what you find in our modern society, the taking care of ourselves gets translated into uh, addictive type behaviors, workaholics. It gets translated in the inability to share, the inability to be benevolent and to be compassionate of others. Well, it's, it's pretty <laughs> difficult. How can you help people if you, you need to recognize what is the reason, what is natural reaction, yeah. what is uh, unconscious reaction, yeah. what is just natural reaction because this type of the character of the people. How can you find the important point inside the soul? Well, you know, I, I've been uh, on that journey of trying to figure that out, finding a language. And interestingly, I've kind of run across something I read when I was in graduate school. It was by Viktor Frankl, and he was a survivor of, of the Holocaust, and he was in concentration camps. And he said, literally, that free will exists in the space between the stimulus and the response. And what I'm saying, yeah, the stimulus response, I feel it, but I have free will. I don't need to respond. So what we find in the people is they get locked into responding to those bodily feelings without reflecting on it and understanding why they're why they why they are kind to create a behavior which had been associated with being under threat when they should just really just literally listen to themselves. Uh, so I actually I'm going to go on a little bit on this because I think it is the biggest problem is to create that space because 
we as a species want to react. So when we get triggered, we want to react. We feel it's our mandate. It's our what it's our oath to survive. And it is in a way to survive. But often the signals which are reflexive are not real threats to our own safety. It's kind of like we have triggered it, but it's still it's not a, it, the stimulus is in itself is no longer a potent stimulus that can hurt us. All it's doing is signaling that at some point in our past, it had hurt us. And this is, so what I'd like to often say is all therapies dealing with trauma are all therapies of re-embodiment. In a sense, getting back inside our body, getting better brain-body communication, and basically learning how to listen to our body before we respond. All right. So if I understand it well, uh, you are dealing with the processes that are very strong inside mm -hmm. our souls and our bodies. Mm -hmm. So we cannot change them uh, by will. I cannot... Uh, right. Play. We cannot change them, but often, and this is really the paradox, we think we should be able to, and we get angry at ourselves, and we blame ourselves because we are still reacting to it rather than understanding that they are really very low in the brain. They're in our brainstem. Then now we're near our conscious brain, but they influence our conscious brain. And we're misled. We think that intentionality, the conscious brain, controls our behavior. And in the world that you're in, which is the world I'm in, how often are people destabilized without a, I say, really intellectual rationale for for why they are reactive but they try to create one well i think that honestly uh, if we are able to be honest to ourselves uh i'm led by my brain and my rationality really seldom <laughs> <laughs> uh, but back to the uh, to the real topic we are talking about uh if it is so deep yeah. i I doubt that it's possible to help me if I would be your client by talking, by classical way oh. of therapy. Well, let's start off by saying I'm not a therapist. <laughs> okay. uh, this, well, this, uh, this, this is, this is, yeah, this is giving me tremendous privilege because I don't have clients, but I can understand what clients are experiencing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I deconstruct what's going on. And the answer is talk therapy isn't, isn't going to work unless the nervous system is safe enough to be accessible to that type of interaction. So it really has a, let's say, a foundation of, of bodies feeling safe with each other. And what you would probably call it is that if you're in a trusting relationship, certain things can happen. You can, so, and, and you can start expressing yourself in a different way. So now we are very close to a polyvagal theory. Is it right? Yeah, yeah. So what we've really, uh, if you want the principles, the in, in be, the body's physiological state is a major determinant of how we react. And so when you're saying if your body is in more in a state of threat, you're going to be very biased to be reactive and irritable. If your body's mm -hmm. calm, or what I say, if you feel safe inside yourself, well, there's flexibility, there's compassion, uh, and things are better. So the in, in between the context, the stimulus, and our behavioral, our psychological, and verbal responses is our physiological state. And the theory says, well, why not focus on that physiological state as a portal of intervention? What if we calm people's bodies down before we challenge them with any form of interaction? So that's point number one. Point number two was this concept of neuroception. We react to stimuli, often reflexively. Our nervous system detects signals of threat. But unlike other more primitive vertebrae, social mammals, especially humans and dogs and cats and horses, they detect signals of safety. And what are signals of safety? Signals of safety are the intonation of a mother's voice when the mother tells the baby, sweetheart, calm down, or sings a little lullaby, the baby gets like this. Well, so do our cats and our dogs when we talk to them in that melodic voice. So the intonation of her voice is more important to our nervous system in making us accessible 
than the actual words that people are using. So the way we speak works. Now, why is that true? Well, because the nerves that regulate the larynx and pharynx that give us intonation are integrated with the nerve that regulates a lot of our visceral organs, basically the vagus. So our voice is really broadcasting our physiological state. So the evolutionary journey of sociality in mammals was that they were broadcasting whether they were safe enough to come close to in their voice. Now, as a podcast host, a director of movies, uh, interactor with people, you know intuitively with whom you can have a good interview with based on the intonation of their voice, how welcoming, how accessible they are. So you know on your own physiological level what I'm talking about. All right. And please, can you tell me more about use of the polyvagal theory then in uh, in a concrete uh, therapy and in a contact oh, uh, with the clients, with the, with the people who are trying to solve their personal problems? Okay, so if you were to ask, let's reframe the question and ask, can a therapist be polyvagal informed and will it help right. the therapist uh, with, with the outcomes of their patients be better? And the answer is certainly, but it's going to be so intuitive. It would be like saying, if a person is more polyvagal informed, will they have better relationships? Will their children thrive better? Or if you were a teacher, will your students do better? Or if you were a physician and you were polyvagal informed, would your clients be less frightened and more compliant with the treatments? The answer is always going to be yes, because the basis is the ability to trust the other person. And what happens in this process of trust is really that the physiology is now promoting feelings of safety, which makes the nervous system accessible to whatever intervention is being used. Uh, excuse me if I will simplify it too much now. Uh, can you tell me some advices how I can just put it into my life, into my interpersonal situations, into my meeting, into uh, my relation uh, with uh, close people. Should I do it somehow? Can I do it somehow? You're probably doing it anyway. Yeah, unintentionally. <laughs> The way, yeah. how do yeah. I promote myself? Uh, yeah, well, look, you're, you, you're, you're a podcast host. And you are inviting accessibility with whomever you're talking to. Now, whether your invitation is accepted is going to vary on the other person's nervous system. So your experience of these interviews is really a function of this co-regulation that's occurring between your speech, your facial expressivity, and, and the interviewee, my speech, my facial expressivity. If if someone kind of interrupts it, oh, you don't get what I'm talking about, you're already, you know, it's a violation of it. But if the person says, look, I understand what you're saying, but I see it slightly different. Suddenly you have a nice dialogue. So sh can I even say that if I meet anybody, our nervous vagus yeah. starts the dialogue? Yeah. Well, what you would be saying is that you're, brain through neuroception is starting to detect features of safety and risk. If it detects features of safety, then that vagus in our voice, they were right there. So facial expressivity, intonation of voice, gestures, and your nervous system will interpret as a, oh, that's an interesting person. I'd like to know that person. And if now I will put this or, or I, will, I will move this point to the trauma, if yeah. I'm locked in my feeling of unsafety or if I feel yeah. I, I feel necessity to uh, control the situation, yes, <laughs> uh, then what is happening with my nervous vagus and uh, in uh, interaction with the other people? It's turned off because it's... I'm sorry, the, it's turned off. Is it's it not... Off? It or we could say it's dampened or it's compromised. Yes. Uh, I like to say it, it it's uh, it becomes dormant or it goes on a vacation. Yes, yes, Basically, yes. when you dampen it, you're giving permission to your sympathetic, your mobilization, your fight flight system to be accessible. So if you're under states of threat, the social vagus is going down for a very adaptive reason. You need the metabolic resources to get the hell out of there if something happens. This is terrible. 
This is <laughs> I, I, I'm serious. I, I, we are talking about how important it is in, in yeah. the relation. Yeah, but it's, but you're, in that, it's in itself. It's not terrible. What's terrible is how we respond to it. We uh, blame the person for being defensive, with the belief that they don't have to be. That it's intentional behavior. And they are literally screaming at us, and they often will be screaming, that their bodies are under a state of threat. And we're saying, get a hold of yourself, act like an adult or something like that. Yes. So we are even change our tone to give up its prosody, and we're not supporting their need for safety because we evaluated what they're doing, and we're shaming them. We're doing something even worse. And that is horrible. So the issue is, how do you calm a body that's in a state of threat? And I would basically tell everyone to look at a mother and her infant, a good mother, a mother who calms her infant, not a mother who, when a baby is crying, shakes the baby or yells at the baby, uh, yeah. but a mother who, who literally empathically allows her body and her voice to serve as support for the infant. Maybe if anybody is now listening to us or watching the interview and can recognize uh, himself in this situation well, well i know it personally that's uh, that it happens sometimes to me can i do something to meet again with myself yeah we have to start with awareness you see the issue is everything starts with our own awareness and let's go back to the victor frankel point and that is a space between the stimulus and the response that is our physiological state and we have to be aware of it so it's not that i reacted But am I aware of that reaction? Am I aware of that physiological shift? And then I get, a, 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 in a sense, a wow, or what happened to me? Why did this happen? Why did my body go there? And then we get into the issue of understanding if my body reacted like that, how do I convince my body that it's not under threat? How do I calm my body? Do I need to leave the room? Do I need to go for a walk? For many people, they just say, "Let me leave me alone. I'll go into a, a room. I'll do some breathing, slow exhalations. So remember, we talk a lot about, quote, hacking the vagus, calming ourselves down. But we can be more sophisticated. When we exhale slowly, then that social vagus comes back on board. When we inhale, we block it. So when people get frightened, they basically inhale over longer periods of time than they exhale, they hyperventilate. And this is to keep them mobilized. And now we know that if we exhale slowly, the vagus finds its way back and calms us down. And actually, if we extend the duration of the phrases that we use when we speak, what are we doing? We're exhaling slowly. And I actually will tell you a little story Uh, and this is, I was giving a talk at a large meeting, there'd be a thousand people there. The night before, a the person who was going to introduce me came up to me and she said, Steve, I'm extraordinary. Actually, she says, I'm scared to death about introducing you. I said, don't worry about it. I'll fix it. Now, we all say things at parties. So the next morning at 10 minutes to nine, nine o'clock was when I was to talk. She walks up to me and she says, Steve, fix it. <laughs> so I realized, okay, so I was realized how she was breathing. She was making big inhalations, short exhalations, and basically using for each breath, maybe one or two words. So she was literally what we would call huffing and puffing, mm -hmm. getting herself mobilized. So I said to her, I said, increase the duration of your phrases. Try to add more words before you take a breath. Now, For the first couple of tries, it was hard. And then it started to just expand. Her face changed. Her posture shifted. And she went up and gave a beautiful introduction. And then she decided, because she was a clinician, this is how she was going to treat speaking anxieties. So she's using this in her treatment model. But it was a very simple model. And this is, I think, what you're asking is, I could. she wasn't exactly aware of what was happening to her, but I was. I could see in her body and her breath what she was doing. Her body, she was this uh, fearful. And under fear, her body was producing or supporting fight-flight behaviors. Not very useful in giving an introduction in front of a lot of people. So just by getting her voice to extend the phrases, to calm it down, suddenly she became in her body more, more aware of where she was. And 
more in control. So it was really a beautiful example that I would say I didn't think a lot about the intervention, but I was fortunately to have a good insight at that moment. Dr. Porges, thank you very much for touching the polyvagal theory and your work because it's so complex. For me, it changed the perspective of how things about the people who are sometimes arguing, fighting, or suddenly changing their moods and just yeah. psychic position. It changed my perspective how to think about myself, about yeah. my situation. And it changed my perspective about the importance of breath, and intonation of my voice and the sound of my voice and yeah. all the interaction uh, of the people uh, anywhere, yeah. really, really yeah. anywhere. Uh, uh, where should I invite people who wants to know more to your website? Uh, Polyvagal yeah, well, the Polyvagal Institute website, which is polyvagalinstitute.org. It's Polyvagal Institute, one word, and that's the best place to get information. And I will invite everybody to 22nd of April and then to the to the conference uh, where your speech and your interaction with people will be presented. It's very important. Oh, also, I've been invited to talk in Prague in 2025. So, and I intend, I'm planning on attending. So that would be very nice. Great. So I'm looking forward to the meetings that will happen and that you will, I believe, enjoy in my beautiful country. I, I look forward to it. Thank you very much. For today it's all. You can find the link to the website in the caption of this video. Have a wonderful time. I wish you total mental and physical well-being and harmony. And I look forward to the next time. You're Peter Hockey.